kids this morning and all of the all the things that come along with that. They had 14 in the kids' Sunday school this morning, which is a good group. Uh, we're in Revelation chapter 8 this morning. We'll find if you'll please find your place there. Revelation chapter 8. And I am greatly looking forward to the opportunity to be in the scripture here this morning. And uh, really kind of following up, last week we were uh, in this portion of Revelation. We are beginning to see that God is going to work in the future through the national kingdom or the nation of Israel. And last week we saw 144,000 individuals who are going to be marked <coughs> with the seal of God in their forehead. 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes of Israel. And I'm not sure if that message is online yet on our YouTube webpage, but it really lays the foundation for where we're going from here forward in Revelation. And so if you did, were not able to be here last Sunday, uh, it should be on our YouTube page. And, and if, you, if you look for it and you can't find it, please let me know, and I'll try to figure out how to find it and uh, make that available for you as well. I do apologize last week for my PowerPoint. I had no idea that it would project so poorly uh, with the, the Scripture verses being so tiny no one could see them. But we'll be working on that in the future and try to improve. We are trying to improve and grow. If you look at things that are going on in our ministry and you say, wow, these folks could sure do things a lot better, we're well aware of that and we're working on it. We're busy. A lot of times people come and say, Pastor, we ought to. And I think, well, you know, right now I'm pastoring two churches. And, hey, Starja, you're singing beautifully. Uh, but I, I want to speak instead of you singing. We'll have you sing for us <laughs> sometime soon. Uh, good song that she has there. But uh, uh, anyway, but we're trying. And we're trying to improve. We, we know that we need to make some uh, improvements with our facilities and so forth. Let's be thankful for what we have. And let's be aware of ways that we can grow. And then you get involved. You plug in in our ministry. Uh, it is so vital that believers find their place in their church and plug into it. Literally get used. We can use you in this ministry and you could make it better than it is. It's uh, we, We're in 1 Corinthians right now. We're looking at spiritual gifts on Wednesday evenings. One of the things that I'm always reminded about when I read through that portion of the Scripture is how that God gives every member of the church gifts. And therefore the purpose, their use, is to be part of their church. So God has gifted you and you are what our church needs. And so I'd encourage you to get involved and, and be in your place and, and do your part, and it'll make it all that much better. Uh, Anthony, are you playing with a doll? <laughs> I just can't focus when I see a big grown man like that who had a birthday yesterday and turned 19 years old holding a doll in his hand. So uh, thank you, sir. <laughs> All right. I didn't mean to embarrass him, but it's really hard to speak when you see a big guy like Anthony holding a doll. So she is very cute. It was a cute doll that she had to put her down. Okay. All right. If you if you just see what I see. By the way, I see everything. If you're texting somebody, uh, if you're if you're talking to each other, I see it, and it is a distraction to me in the service. And if it's enough of a distraction, I'll address it. As you may have noticed this morning, and you normally don't do that. I don't like to embarrass people or call people out, so I'm pretty patient about it. But when I see a man playing with a doll, it just takes me past that line of ability to ignore. So, be in Revelation chapter 8 this morning. All right, let's, let's find our text in verse 1, and uh, we'll begin reading there. The Bible says, And when he had opened the seventh seal, there was a silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. And I saw the seven seals, or the seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer. And there was given unto him much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar and cast it into the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. And the seven angels which had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. The first angel sounded. And we'll end there and go to the Lord for prayer. Shall we? 
Father, we pray for Your help, not only with our understanding, but God, just for clarity of the Scripture as it's preached. And most importantly, God, for application, that You would show us from Your Word truth that can be lived today, truth that we can live now in light of. And we ask this for Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, here we are in Revelation chapter 8, and as I began to say earlier, we have seen that this is a point where God in the future begins to work with national Israel. And it's really just an important theological truth. See, a lot of folks are actually confused about the difference between the church and between national Israel, and they are different. National Israel uh, has never been a guarantee, that is, being a, the nationality, being a Jew uh, by the flesh, has never been a guarantee that you're God's child. But the nation of Israel is the only nation which, as a people, have represented God. It's interesting when Paul gives illustrations about how the, that God did miracles for the people of Israel, like took them out of Egypt and took them through the Red Sea and provided for them in the wilderness, and then because of their unbelief, their carcasses died in the wilderness. It's interesting that though they were God's people, that merely being part of a nation, being born into a nation is not enough. It's faith that saves. And it has always been faith that has saved. And so that's what we see in, Re in Hebrews as well. We see individuals that believed God by faith, and their faith was counted for righteousness. Can I say that today, it does not matter your heritage. There are many individuals in the world who believe that because as a baby, they were baptized into a church organization that they have eternal life or that somehow that is what they can depend on, that they have a relationship with God. And my friend, it is not so and it never has been so. There are individuals that think because of the people that they're born into uh, the national group being part of, for instance, the nation of Israel, that that means that they are God's child. And friend, it's a different thing than to be part of a nation that God has a plan and a purpose to use and being God's child as an individual. You must be born again. And that is by faith. And it is that way. And it always has been that way. There are individuals in the world, tragically, that think that because they are related to someone who has faith. Do not know how many times I've asked someone if they're going to heaven and they tell me about a loving grandmother or uh, who reads her Bible and who prays and who prays for them and who uh, is spiritual. And because they're related to that grandmother, they think that somehow they're charmed and they're going to heaven or a mother. I don't know how many ladies have told me my grandfather was a preacher. He was a pastor and I grew up going to church. So of course... I'm a Christian. Of course, I'm God's child. And my friend, they're no more God's child uh, than a person who's never darkened the doors of a church and who is related to no one who knows God. The reality of it is that your relationship with God is an individual matter, and you know if you're born again. And God knows if you're born again. And whatever you tell me, if it aligns itself with the Word of God, is what I'll believe. But you could lie to me about it. I've met people that have said, I said that I prayed to receive Jesus as my Savior, but in my heart I did not. In my heart I did not want to be God's child. And my friend, if you don't want to be saved, you're not born again. God does not force anyone to be His child. God does not by default force anyone into heaven. Salvation is by faith, has been by faith, and always will be by faith. And so God knows that in the, this period when the church has been taken, you never see again, after chapter 3 of Revelation, you never see the church ever referenced again in God's future plan, the way that it's going to work. And now we've been introduced to Israel, 144,000. But these are not just Jews. These are individuals who have the seal of God on their foreheads. Do you think that in the whole world, of all the unbelieving Jews, there are only 144,000 that are alive at this time before the tribulation, uh, the, the wrath of God really begins to be poured out? Do you think that there are only 144,000? No, not on your life. These are 144,000 which have turned in their hearts to God. 144,000 Jews who are believers in God. And God has numbered out of the 12 tribes, 12,000 of every nation. And they are going to be the evangelists that are going to be reaching those individuals that we're going to see become the future martyrs. And that become those individuals that uh, are ill-treated and mistreated. Uh, then the national Israel will be the ones who make a covenant with the beast 
and uh, who are turned uh, against and turned upon by the beast. And we're going to see some event uh, eventual um, happenings in Revelation where God is going to ultimately ending up the kingdom of God is going to come and God is going to reign on this earth. And we're going to see those events unfold in Revelation. This is a fascinating period uh, of time that is in the future. And I want to say about this that there is a blessing we saw when we began our series for those that hear, that do, and that read, that hear, and that do the things that are written in this book. And I cannot simply share with you enough truths for you to have that blessing. This must be a matter of personal study. My goal as pastor is to guide you and to give you answers for many things that have come up and to preach uh, practical messages that you can apply to your life today. But I cannot possibly substitute study that would show yourself approved unto God. You must study the Word of God. Can I urge you as a believer to be a student of the Scripture? You say, Pastor, I cannot read. I do not know how many people that I've met in my lifetime, but it has been many, who could not even read when they became burdened about the matter of studying the Scripture. And they learned to read in order to study the Scripture. You could read. You could. You could read the Scripture. Pastor, I have a hard time studying. My friend... I know many individuals who failed their way through school but when they became burdened about knowing God and knowing what His Word said and having a personal relationship with Him. They became students like none other. And so you can, with God's help, the Holy Spirit's able to teach you and to guide you into all truth. And I want to encourage you to be a, study, a student of the Scripture. Oh, it'll be a help to you to come to church and hear the Word of God preached. And you'll know as much as it's preached as much of it as you're able to retain. But you could know so much more if you yourself would be a student of the Scripture. And there will be a blessing for it. And it will be worth your while. And so I'd urge you to get in the Word of God and study it for yourself. And it will supplement and it will help our study. And many of the gaps that are left unanswered by my inability to communicate or by my inability to preach everything that's in the Word of God, which is not possible for any human, uh, my inability, those gaps will be filled by your personal study. Okay, now here we are at a place where we're going to see the seventh seal judgment. Uh, this, we saw the seven trumpets and then the, uh, the last of the, of the trumpets uh, has been opened and we see that, uh, I'm sorry, the, the seal judgments, the last of the seals are, are uh, the sixth seal is open. In that sixth seal, we see seven trumpets. And these trumpets are judgments. Judgments at the hand of God. Need I remind you that the judgments in this period when God is working are not random happenings. I was just looking at what others have written about the passage that we're going to be preaching today. And I read very, very authoritatively stated by some individuals that these judgments are brought about by the enactment of a third great world war as though there have only been two great world wars, the ones recorded in our near history. But these are enacted by the third great world war and that the result of these judgments are because of the nuclear, uh, the, the nuclear holocaust. My friend, that's nonsense. Yes. We have here seen heaven opened and God on the throne standing there and these angels are not allegories. They are not representations of bombs and tanks and nations. These are literally angels from God. And here we see seven angels which represent seven judgments. These angels have seven trumpets and when the trumpet sounds, the angel enacts their judgment. And friend, in the midst of all of this, seated on the throne in heaven, visible is God. The heavens have been rolled away, they're opened up and literally visible as the great judge of the nations is God Himself, to whom the nations of the earth have fled away and cried to the rocks and tried to hide themselves in caves and said the rocks, fall on us because they had rather die than bow the knee to God in heaven. But there are those who have believed and there are those who will believe. Uh, sadly, tragically enough, there are many or some individuals that try to teach that during the great tribulation period, which we now are in, in our study, during that tribulation of God judging the world, that there are that the, the opportunity to receive the gospel and believe in Jesus is past. That isn't so at all. These 144,000 Jews who are uh, here sealed with the seal of God on their foreheads are the first contradiction of that assumption. 
Now, here uh, we're going to see then, today we're going to look at seven of the trumpets. We won't get finally through uh, this passage of Scripture, but we're going to run through seven of the trumpet judgments and look at what they are. And again, I want to remind you in each of them that there is a theme, and that is that it is at the hand of God that these seven angels are used to judge the world. Okay, you ready? Here we go. Hang on. In verse uh, in verse 3, we see in, of chapter 8, another angel came and stood at the altar having a golden censer. And there was given unto him much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. Now this is not some Catholic concept here. This is not one of those spooky things if you've ever been uh, in a Catholic church where you've got a censer waving with incense in it. By the way, that makes my eyes water. But uh, with the incense waving in it and the priest doing, making weird mystical motions and chanting and so forth. No, this is an angel with a censer. These are literal saints uh, that, that have, have uh, prayed. And we saw them, actually, the saints that were below the altar, we saw them when we saw the, se the seven seals open. These are the saints that have been martyred for their faith and they've washed their robes and, uh, in the blood of the Lamb and they're sitting under the altar asking, how long, O oh Lord, until you judge, until you avenge us of your blood? And these saints have prayed and now God is answering that prayer. Now God is saying, now, now I'll avenge the innocent blood that was shed. And so look at verse uh, 7. The Bible says, And the first angel sounded. That's the trumpet. It's a trumpet that is sounded. This is not to be, by the way, confused with when we look in 2 Thessalonians chapter 5 when the Bible says, At the last trump. These are not, this, that is not uh, a trump. It says, With the voice of the archangel. These, these are not the archangels. That isn't the same trump. That's when the saints, uh, which are buried in the graves, will, will uh, be resurrected. And they'll already be with the Lord, won't they? The ones whose prayers will be answered here. And so uh, that's, that is speaking of the taking up or the gathering up the rapture of the saints in 2 Thessalonians chapter 5. These are the seven seal judgments, not a, judge, a, a trumpet judgment. These are the seven, seven trumpet judgments, not the single trumpet judgment. Okay, verse 7. The first angel sounded, and there followed hail and fire mingled with blood, and they were cast upon the earth, and the third part of trees was burnt up, and all green grass was burnt up. How much green grass? All of it. Okay, so the first trumpet judgment is a hail and fire mixed with blood judgment that burns up the all, or it burns up a three third of the trees and all the green grass. You ever traveled in one of the national parks? Uh, last, I think it was last fall, maybe the year, no, last, the year before last, went out to Yellowstone. Yellowstone's not as pretty as it could be right now because of the forest fires out there. You go out to Yellowstone and you'll just see a lot of brown, like, you know, not, I mean, just miles of just burned up area. It's really sad because of mismanagement individuals that believe in worshiping the earth instead of stewarding the earth have come to the place that, you know, don't cut a tree because if you cut a tree, you know, you're going to injure a living being, you know, and they hold trees on the same value of life as a human. And the result of just trying to preserve those things has actually resulted in the destruction of, of it. And because of mismanagement, now <laughs> it's interesting to listen to uh, the the uh, fire services that work in the national parks and so forth. Now they're saying, we have this brilliant thing that we do now. Now when lightning starts a fire, we let it burn and it burns out the dead wood and that preserves the forest. Instead of putting out all the fires, uh, we have been putting them out. And now we don't have all the dead wood and now trees survive forest fires. It's genius, isn't it? How God made the, the earth and God has preservation method set in it. But uh, you know, I'll tell you something, it's not very enjoyable to look at, look at an earth without a lot of trees. The parts of Yellowstone that have trees are still very pretty, but the parts that don't are just kind of barren right now. And there's new growth that's coming in, but it'll be 30 or 40 years before it begins to look as pretty as it did a few years back. And that's too bad. Can you imagine a third part of the earth? A third of the trees on earth? Now, I don't want trees in our parking lot. I hate what they do to our cars. But I don't want all trees gone everywhere. You know, 
And that's what it is. Grass. All of the grass is burned up. Now, friend, this is not, you know, Kim Jong-un going, becoming unhinged and releasing a nuclear bomb and it does this kind of destructive force. This is not the President of the United States with his, you know, with his uh, out-of-control finger on the nuclear button, you know, losing control. Friend, this is God in heaven raining down fire and hail mixed with blood. And things have just gotten real. All of a sudden, the scoffers who have said, where is the promise of His coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continued as they are till now. All of a sudden, they're saying, there He is. There He is. And now, God has begun to wreak havoc on rebellious mankind. And He's not using a human instrument to do so. Amen. He is sending His angels. It isn't merely, this may be the hand of God. No, my friend, it is the hand of God. And you and I ought to be continually reminded we don't want to be on the receiving end of the hand of God in judgment. And God gave us the ability to escape the wrath of God through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. And it is a universal offer that whosoever shall call the name of the Lord shall be saved. Saved from what? Well, this would be one of the things you're saved from. Judgment. God's hand of judgment. There will be no doubt by anyone in the world who is judging here. It will not be, is this hurricane, is this small storm, is this force of nature the hand of God? No, God's hand will be seen. His angel will blow a trump and then the judgment comes forth. The first, the first judgment. A third of the trees and all the grass burned up. Verse 8 and 9. And the second angel sounded, and as it were, a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea. And the third part of the sea became blood. Now I can imagine, and I'm quite certain that my imagination doesn't have the scope to really visualize what this will in effect actually be. In other words, it looks like a great mountain. A great mountain burning with fire. You ever seen a big mountain? I had the privilege some years back of going to Alaska and working on a project up there for a missionary. But one of the things we got to do uh, was I got to do a little flying with the missionary. One of the things we saw when we were flying was Mount McKinley. I mean, it's just, <laughs> there it is by itself, this huge, huge mountain. I mean, when, you're, when you get anywhere within 100 miles of Mount McKinley on a clear day, there it is. You can just see it. And when you get close to it, you're, you're just amazed at how big it is. And I can only imagine what that a mountain, or as it were a great mountain, it's perhaps not an actual mountain, it's just something the size of a mountain, burning with fire thrown into the sea. Yeah, like a volcano, but not a volcano. I have heard people, oh, it's a volcano. No, it isn't a volcano. It comes from the... It comes from heaven is thrown into the ocean. Maybe this is a meteorite. It's not a meteorite. God in heaven at the trump, at, the, at this angel's trumpet sounding, God in heaven throws this massive piece of fire into the ocean. The result of it is that a third of the creatures in the sea uh, are, are uh, destroyed. A part, third part of the sea, the Bible says, becomes blood. Now explain that one away. Oh, it's red tide. <laughs> no, I don't think. Don't think so. Now, my friend, a third of part becomes literal blood. Just like in Egypt, when God had Moses and Aaron stretch out the rod and the sea and the rivers became blood. This is not the river. That will that'll come in a minute. But the Bible says the result, verse 9, is a third part of the creatures which are in the sea and had life died, and a third part of the ships were destroyed. Has anyone seen the results of the red tide? Has anybody... Ben, Joel, you saw it. Yes, saw the dead fish, in Brother John. And we when was it? 82. In '82. So you saw it in Sarasota. Yeah, yeah isn't it interesting? Uh, the the way it's presented in the media is this red tide thing is something that's never happened before. But yet, when you read about individuals that the explorers exploring the United States, they talked about a red tide in the Gulf that was hundreds of miles out, and all the fish were dead as a result of it. Well, if you've seen something like that, it's pretty grotesque. 
it's uh, it's actually pretty tragic. It, it bothers me to see fish and animals and creatures in the sea. And we've got some large creatures in the sea. Certainly, certain parts of the world have whales and so forth. And literally, there is this rotting mass of flesh because the creatures, a third of the creatures in the sea, are dead. Now, the ocean t makes up a, the the majority of the world. So, if you're talking about a third of the ocean of the world being destroyed and becoming blood. This is not a, you know, microcosm or a uh, localized event. This is something, the results of which would affect the whole world. From the tsunami in Japan a few years ago, remember that tsunami in Japan a couple years ago? We're still having containers washing up on the west coast of the United States. And debris from that, ships and so forth, are washing up from that. Can you imagine a third part of the ocean being destroyed with the currents that are in it and so forth? This is going to have a worldwide impact. There won't be a place in the world that has pure salt water. Now, I know that's a little bit of an oxymoron. I said it on purpose that way. But there won't be a place where the ocean is something you'd want to go take a, a nice leisurely swim in. This thing is going to be disgusting, and the effects of it are going to be known by everyone in the world. And then the Bible gives us the third trumpet judgment. That's the second. The sea is destroyed and the life that's in it. Third part of it. In verse uh, 10, And the third angel sounded, and there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp. And it fell upon the third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of waters. And the name of the star is called Wormwood. And the third part of the waters became Wormwood, and many men died of the waters because they were made bitter. A third of the fresh water... Oh, did you say something? Poison. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's poison. Wormwood's poison. And it's bitter, and it's, it's undrinkable, and it kills a third of the men on the earth. Now, up to this point, the populations of the world have not been judged, and so the world is fully populated. I do not know what the population of the world will be. I don't know when the Lord Jesus is going to return and these events are going to begin being set in course. But we could very, very practically assume billions, could we not? We don't know the effects of abortion. We know that right now, every single day, 125,000 babies are murdered around the world every single day. We know that uh, every single year, in the state of New York in the United States, for every black child that's born, one is murdered. And for, uh, and, and in addition to that, thousands every year more than one to one uh, are not allowed to live. So we know that many are being murdered, but still the population of the world is increasing every single day. We know that five million people a year are murdered, not allowed to be born. And the beautiful truth in that, it, it, in spite of the evil of man, is that those individuals will be with the Lord. And it's amazing how God could take something that is literally makes you just vomit. And He could take that thing and, and make something good about it, out of it. But there will be billions of people, and a third of them will die from the waters being turned to wormwood. Could we say billions will be dead? Who will bury them? A third of the fish in the sea are dead. Who will bury them? A third of the waters will be turned to blood. A third of the, wa of the rivers will be bitter and poisonous. I do not have the scope of imagination to comprehend what the world will be like in that day. You can go to Hiroshima today and there are people living there. The earth destroyed this way will never be inhabitable in these places ever again. This part of the world will be just destroyed. And this is destruction at the hands of God. I trust for you as sobering as it is for me to recognize that it is a fearful thing indeed to fall into the hands of a living God. Can I remind you at the midpoint of our message today that no one has to be judged by God in this way? None of us have to. Call in the name of the Lord. The Bible says, Whosoever shall call in the name of the Lord shall be saved. And we're in that age of grace. We're in that dispensation where God says, If you call in the name of the Lord, you'll be saved. Oh, my friend, you are playing 
with the hand of God's judgment, and this is not something like anything anyone's ever seen before. It is a fearful, it is a terrible thing to fall into the hands of a living God. Let's look at number 4, verse 12. The fourth angel sounded, and the third part of the sun was smitten, and the third part of the moon, and the third part of the stars. So as the third part of them was darkened, and the day shone not for a third part of it, and the night likewise. Stop here for a moment because I'd like to just discuss this for a second. If a third of the stars, a third of the planets are destroyed, can you imagine climate change <laughs> at this time? This will certainly be global cooling, will it not? Uh, yesterday we were in Tennessee, uh, some of us men at, at the men's retreat, and uh, one of the things, really Friday was the day we were outdoors the most. And it was pretty nice. We actually really enjoyed the weather up there. It was 40-ish when we got up in the morning, maybe 44, something like that. And it warmed up to 50-something during the daytime. And it was just balmy when the sun was shining. We were outside shooting bow and arrows and throwing hatchets and shooting firearms and chasing each other around and uh, having a good time. And it was nice out until the sun went behind the clouds. And the moment the sun went under the cloud, it got cold. <laughs> and I'll just tell you something, you eliminate a third part of the light on earth, and everything's going to be cold. It's going to be a chilly atmosphere. So things are going to be disgusting, and they're going to be disgusting and cold by the time the fourth trump, or the fourth uh, seal, or I'm sorry, the fourth trumpet judgment that comes into place. That's number four. And then we see in verse 13 a little bit of a transition between the fourth and the fifth angel. I beheld and heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven saying with a loud voice, Whoa, whoa, whoa! To the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpet of the three angels which are yet to sound. Oh me. Things are about to get bad now. Now things are going to be terrible. What is the old saying? The beatings will continue until morale gets better. <laughs> morale will never be better. Isn't it so? Yeah. Or his beatings will continue until morale improves, I think is what it says. So things are terrible. A third of the world is really in bad shape. The water, the waters are destroyed, the rivers are destroyed, and now the, the, the light from the stars and the planets has been taken away, a third of that. And now an angel flies around and says, look out, it's coming. Now things are going to get bad. <laughs> Anybody have parents who when they disciplined said, you know, quit crying or I'll give you something to cry about? <laughs> yeah, or had... Uh, something like that. I lived in one of those houses, you know. Uh, you know, you you think things are bad. It's about to get real. And I did live in a home where things could get worse. And so <laughs> that was entirely possible. Well, this is no laughing matter here. Things are, in my mind, <clears throat> unimaginably terrible. How about you? I mean... The description that we have in the Scripture, your ability to comprehend and imagine it. Is that horrible? I mean, is it beyond description? It is. I, I can visualize it, but the five senses are not dealing with it. I'm not actually seeing it. I'm not actually smelling it. I'm not actually feeling it. I'm not actually touching it. I'm not actually tasting it. Anyone who's alive at this time will. And then they're told, judgment's coming. Heard people make the statement, cavalier, careless statement, this is hell. My life is hell. This is not even hell. This is not even hell. My friend, you and I ought to believe the Word of God enough to be horrified at the prospect of hell. 
sometimes we talk about hell like it's just some kind of place or some kind of location. And here I'm seeing a place that for anything you could pay me, I would never want to be. And it's not even hell. This should be a sobering moment for us. Why is it God reveals something like this to us? Is it for us no. to be horrified at? Is it for us to have this drama, this dramatic thoughts and discussion? No. I believe God gives us this description. He shows us the future mm -hmm. so that today we can live in light of not only this horrific event, but the more eternally horrific event, which is hell, and ultimately that will be cast in the lake of fire. My friend, torment. This is not even torment. And individuals have the audacity to say, why doesn't God do something? Why doesn't God judge? If God were good, He would. My friend, when God judges, <laughs> you'll be saying, oh me. Just like this angel, whoa, whoa, whoa. This is terrible. And now things are going to be really terrible. Okay, so let's look at the next three. First one of chapter 9. A fifth angel sounded. We'll just read all the way down uh, to verse 12 and we'll see actual living beasts that are given the ability to torment men. The fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit, as the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power as the scorpions of the earth have power. And it was commanded to them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth. Well, good. Take care of the grass. It's growing back now. <laughs> Neither any green thing. Good. We don't want, to, don't want to hurt the trees or don't want to hurt the plants. Neither any tree. But only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. Let's pause here for a second. These creatures which today are locked in the bottomless pit... Are they angelic beings from heaven? No. Well, actually, they probably are. They're fallen angelic beings. These are demons. <coughs> These are devils. But God's locked them up. There's a star that falls from heaven. What star is that? It's Lucifer. It's a Satan. And he is allowed to let his devils come out. And God says you can't touch those that have the seal of God in their foreheads. You can't touch the saints. But anybody else, you can torment. Listen to me, Satan has never been your friend. As much as he hates God, he is glad at God's permission to torment those who are his minions, unbelievers. You know what Satan wants from anyone who loves him, who worships him, who follows him? He wants to torment them and destroy their soul in hell forever. And you think Satan's powerful today, my friend. He that letteth still will let. That is, the Holy Spirit of God is restricting him. Right. It's stopping him from being as evil as he could be. But here God is going to say, I'm going to let you loose, killer. And you can do with your people what you want to do with them. Aren't you glad you have a God? that instead of destroying people who love Him, realize that no one loves me, but I'll die for the ungodly. Mm -hmm. Instead of sacrificing people for His pleasure, our God sacrificed His Son so we could be redeemed. Oh, what a contrast between the Satan, the adversary, the devil, and a God in heaven who loves us and who wants us to never be in the place of His judgment. Who are the followers of the earth? Who are, I'm sorry, who are the inhabitants of the earth not sealed with the seal of God? Who are they followers of? The devil. Every unbeliever is a servant of the devil. 
And this is the way the devil treats his servants. Don't believe the lies. Don't believe the lies. The devil will give me something. He'll bribe me with something. All the devil will do for a person is promise them something and when he gets them into his clutches, destroy them and never deliver on the promise. Satan's never blessed anybody. Satan's never helped anybody. He's evil. He hates God and he hates God's prized creation, mankind. And he'll do anything to destroy the people even who follow him. My friend, we have a good God. What a fool. What a fool not to bow before God and to thank Him for His Son and to receive His Son as your Savior. How foolish is it? We see further on in verse 5, it was, not, it was given them that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months. And their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when he striketh a man. I haven't had the privilege of being struck by a scorpion. I've only, gotten, only seen a couple of scorpions in my lifetime. Always indoors. Never outdoors, uh, but I've only run into scorpions a couple of times. I've been tempted uh, to be stung by a scorpion just so I can know what it feels like. Uh, but uh, has anyone here ever been stung by a scorpion? Hmm. Mikey, you have. Of course, you have. <laughs> what does it feel good? No. No. Okay. No. All right. I, Mikey's too tough for me to ask him what it feels like because if. Uh, He's had the experience. He'd be like, yeah, it hurts real bad. And I'd be like, I don't know how bad that is. <laughs> he can't describe or compare it. He, he's too much of a tough guy. Uh, but the reality of it is is that a scorpion is supposed to have a terrible sting, of course, depending on the variety. And these are individuals that for five years have free reign to sting anyone who doesn't have the seal of God in their foreheads. It's incredible, isn't it? It's incredible, isn't it? By the way, the church isn't here. The church isn't here. These 144,000 have turned to God. These, there's not only 144,000 of the 12 tribes of, of uh, Judah that are saved, that are born again. There is a host of the, of the redeemed. It's going to be amazing, isn't it, to literally be in a place where all the redeemed from the first man until the last are together and come into the marriage supper of the Lamb and are part of Christ's reign. It's going to be a pretty incredible thing to be with just the multitudes that are believers. As many believers as there are, though, there will be more who do not believe. There always have been. And this is what we see in verse 6, In those days shall men seek death and shall not find it, and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. They literally can't die. There's some application here. We're past the time I wanted to preach this morning, or I would speak to you about the matter of individuals thinking that they hold their own lives in their hands, and yet no person can live without God's giving life, and no person can die without God's allowing it. Friend, you and I do not hold our, our future in our hands. God does. And you can't live or die without God. You cannot even die. I've met people, remember some years back when a man in our church parking lot, Delray Beach, tried to take his own life, and he came in and he threw a melted hose down in the office and he said, I can't even kill myself. And these are individuals who hate God who wish for death, who have no idea of hell, that can't even kill themselves. They cannot even die. Friend, things are terrible. Things are terrible. In verse 7, And the shapes of those locusts were like unto the horses, unto horses prepared unto battle, and on their heads were as it were crowns like gold, and their faces were as the faces of men, and they had hair as the hair of women, and their teeth were as the teeth of lions. And they had breastplates as it were breastplates of iron. And the sound of their wings was as the sound of chariots of many horses running to battle. And they had tails like unto scorpions, and there were stings in their tails, and their power was to hurt men five months. And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon. One woe is past. So out of the, seven, uh, of the seven trumpets, there are three of them are woes. One of them's past. Behold, there are two more woes. There come two woes more hereafter. And now we see the 200,000 horsemen. Verse 13, The sixth angel sounded, I heard the voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel, which hath the trumpet, Loose the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates. And the four angels were loosed, which were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year to slay the third part of men. This is literally a quarter of the tribulation. And the number of the army of the horsemen 
or two hundred thousand thousand, and I heard the number of them. And thus I saw the horses, verse 17, in the vision, and them that sat on them having breastplates of fire and of jacinth and brimstone. And the heads of the horses were as the heads of lions, and out of their mouths issued fire and smoke and brimstone. Hmm. By these three, verse 18, was the third part of men killed by the fire and by the smoke and by the brimstone which issued out of their mouths. Literally, individuals who do not have the power to die on their own are now killed by these angels which are released from below the river Euphrates that are locked up there now. My friend, God has locked up evil. There, the Satan has his minions and his angels, but it's only a small part of his force. And these evil beings are now released and able to wreak havoc and kill a third part of the men on the earth. And then the Bible says in verse 20, this is where we'll end, verse 20 and 21, and the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues yet repented not of the works of their hands that they should not worship devils and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone of wood, which neither can see, nor hear, nor walk. Stop with me now and consider the irony, will you? Heaven is opened. God is on the throne. And all earth sees Him as He is. And they will not worship God, but they'll take an image made out of wood or stone or some type of metal and they'll bow to it. But they will not bow to God. And there, my friend, you find the great illustration of rebellion. This is rebellion. You say, Pastor, how could they? How could anyone well, if you are looking to me for the explanation, three words describe what I know. I don't know. See, shortly after I understood that I was a sinner, I bowed. And I recognized that God could judge me and that I needed Christ for my Savior. I didn't have the heart to rebel to God. I received His love I feared His wrath. And I found that it was better to bow to God than to resist a God who is irresistible. Amen. So I cannot tell you how one could do so because I cannot relate myself and I trust that you cannot either. I hope the question for you is how could they? I hope you don't know the answer. I hope you do not speak words like I'll never bow to God. But those are the words which these individuals speak. And my friend, they're not so different. Nay, they are not different at all from individuals today who have the full Word of God, who have the Spirit of God in the world, who convicts and convinces men of sin, and yet they will not receive Christ as their Savior. And they can explain their rebellion however they wish. I just don't believe there's a God. That's a lie. It's a lie that comes from the rebellion of their heart. I just don't think God is right to require me to only receive Jesus. That's a lie. It's a lie that comes from the heart of rebellion. I just don't think God is good. And I don't think that a God that doesn't judge evil should be worshipped by me. But that's a lie. And it's a lie that comes from a heart of rebellion. My friends, see, the only thing I know about rebellion is it's the same as it was when Cain would not offer the same sacrifice Abel knew to offer to God. He could have, but he would not. It's the same rebellion individuals uh, had in their hearts when Noah warned them of a flood. And they themselves were only a few generations removed from the first man created by God. And they knew who God was, and yet they would not bow to God. It's the same, the same uh, rebellion that caused men to build a tower and say, we're going to be like God and we're going to ascend to heaven where God is. Rebellion, my friend, is the same in every era, the same in every age. The same rebellion that has someone when they're given the gospel that says, you know, I will not receive the gospel. And they, they express their rebellion in different ways. 
Maybe I'm not good enough to be saved. My friend, that isn't the truth. That's just rebellion. Ah, uh, I don't need to be saved because I'm too good for God to judge. My friend, it's a lie. It's just rebellion. See, not believing in Jesus is nothing more than rebellion. It's all it ever has been, and it's all that it ever will be. And it'll be the same. It seems atrocious to us to imagine individuals having seen the hand of God in judgment, seen God on the throne, and knowing whence judgment is coming, for those same individuals to bow to a stick or a stone or a piece of metal, and yet they're doing so because of rebellion. And that's all rebellion has ever been. They literally are shaking their fist at God in heaven and saying, you're going to have to kill me. I'll never bow. And that's the way rebellion is, has been, and will be. The expression of it, different circumstances, different times. But it's the same. If you're here this morning, and you know that Jesus died on the cross for your sins. It's the fact. It's the truth. If you were honest enough to consider it, if you were honest enough to research it, you know that Jesus wasn't just a man, and that He wasn't a myth, but that He was God who came in the flesh, was born of a virgin, and died on the cross for sin, gave His life as a demonstration of God's great love toward us. You know that what the Bible says is true because the Holy Spirit of God will witness it in your own heart. And when the Bible says, Whosoever shall call the name of the Lord shall be saved, you know it's the truth. And if you won't receive it, my friend, it's because of rebellion. And no other explanation can be given on the rebellion. You know, I've stopped in my preaching spending a lot of time trying to reason with rebellion. It cannot be reasoned with because it is not reasonable. When a God who wishes to express Himself as merciful and long-suffering and patient and kind is rejected. His only response to those who rebel is judgment, which is called for, requested, asked for, and ultimately delivered. Is God good? Is God merciful? Is God just? And is He terrible in His great wrath to those who rebel upon to Him? What else can God be? What else can God be? Listen, Christian, you struggle and you say, I don't, know, I don't know how God could destroy the wicked. I just can't imagine God being good and doing that. My friend, you imagine what God should be then. You tell me what God should be then in response to this great rebellion. He is everything He ought to be. And those that receive this judgment so deserve it. I could not, I could not make the decision because I myself deserve judgment and I would just be sitting in the seat of mercy. But a God who's never sinned, to whom all sin is terrible and is against Him, certainly ought to make this decision. And He's right, and He's just, and He's holy. And you and I must be continually reminded that it's so. As we finish today, we can look down to verse 15. We would see that the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ, and He shall reign forever and ever. And we would then transition to the point where Jesus Christ begins to reign on earth. Now let me stop here and let me remind us that there is a God of this world and He's small g today. We're not all God's children. We've seen that as well today. Isn't it so? I've had people say to me, we're all God's children. We're all God's creation. God owns all of us and has the right to judge us. But only His children, or His children are only they who have received Him. To them He gave power to become the sons of God. You're God's children if you've received Him as your Savior. The day is going to come soon. It's going to be short. I don't know when. When these events will have taken place. And the kingdom of God and of His Christ is going to come to this world. The kingdoms of this world, Jesus Christ is going to rule and reign in. The Jehovah's Witnesses are confused. And they're really off. Our friends, the Presbyterians who believe in Jesus, don't really know what a reign of Christ looks like. My friend, this reign is going to be described in the Revelation. And God's going to be a good, just, right ruler. And He'll reign with a rod of iron. And He'll be just and He'll be right and righteous. And we'll get to be part of that future kingdom. We'll see that in the next coming up weeks. And I'm looking forward to it a great deal. As we conclude this morning, let me remind you about the horrors of rebellion the outcome of one who rebels. So let me urge you, if you do not know Jesus as your Savior, 
Do not join the ranks of the rebellious. Do not join the ranks of the one who illogically thinks that somehow he wins. He's victorious by not bowing. Let me urge you to bow to a God who is merciful, loving, kind, and right to judge evil. Let me remind you of our duty to literally knowing the future events that are going to take place for those who are not to receive Jesus. To in mercy and in, 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 in compassion go to a lost world and preach Jesus Christ so that people can escape this terrible judgment. Father, thank you for the truths that we've seen this morning. Lord, we're impressed by you. We're impressed by your hand. God, help us to be more impressed. Help us to be moved by the impression that we've had, that's been made on us today. And help us, God, to bow and to worship you and to serve you and preach the gospel. As a result, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You're dismissed.